Word of God and help me make it plain that we can grasp it and we can live according to what thus says the Lord. This we ask in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. So we're going to let our ushers uh, take your place. We're going to turn to the book of Joel, Old Testament prophet Joel. It's after um, Ezekiel and Daniel and Hosea. You know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, and then Joel. Praise the Lord. Joel chapter 1. My message uh, this morning is uh, Mission Impossible. And the, the guy idea, Mission Impossible to call a solemn assembly. Joel 1.13 uh, says this. And it says in chapter 1, verse 13, New King James Version, it says, gird yourselves. I means put on your clothes. And lament, which means to cry. He says, you priest. Now, priests have the job of ministering in the sacrificial system. Old Testament, you know, everything had to be done a certain way. Well, one of the things that was happening in verse 13 is uh, you get to the point where the prophet had addressed other people and now he's addressing the, uh, the priest he says you clothe yourselves but cry you priests wail you who minister before the altar come lie all night in sackcloth or, or burlap yeah, okay and he says you who minister to my God for the dr uh, grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God in other words the priests are said to cry because there's nothing for them to do. There's nothing for them to do because of the famine, because of what has happened in the land, because of war, all the effects. And so the priests don't have the proper materials to minister. So if you don't have any animals to sacrifice, if you don't have this whole system, then the whole, the, the, you know, everything falls down. So the priests are called to wail. And uh, before that, others are called to cry and to wail because of what's going on. Now, the reason that I'm, uh, I'm looking at this message is a couple of weeks ago or so, uh, one of the pastors in our area passed away. And uh, I think it's Hubert Clardy. And so uh, I got a phone call, no, I got an email that... Starting tomorrow, there was a pastors wanted to get together and call a solemn assembly. And because what happened was that Hubert Clardy, before he died, he called a couple of pastors and he said, this was on my heart, Joel one thirteen. We need to call a solemn uh, assembly. We, and uh, Joel one thirteen through 15, I read 13. Now, the solemn assembly comes, um, where is that? Uh, in verse 14, it says, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, or a solemn assembly, if you've got King James. All right, and so I talked with some people, and uh, my question was, can we call a solemn assembly? Now, we can call a religious gathering. And, but can we call a solemn, or I like the King, new king, can you call a sacred assembly? And that's why I entitled this message, Mission Impossible. Because we can't call a sacred assembly. We can, we can say we can announce church. We can say church 11 o'clock. 
we can call for a meeting. But to call a sacred assembly, there are some requirements here that must happen that only God can bring about. Amen. You know how uh, uh, today, um, the last 30, 40 years or so, uh, it's not as much now as it used to be, but people used to call for healing services. Bring people, I mean, well, after 30, 40, uh, 30 or 40 years of people not being healed, people begin to get a clue. You can't call a healing service because you don't have that kind of power. I mean, and, uh, but, but uh, 40 years ago or so, man, there were all kind of services going on. People, oh, come, you know, we got a healing service. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. Well, folks haven't been healed. So after a while, people began to say, well, wait a minute, maybe we can't do that. You can call a service and ask God to heal, but you can't call a healing service and determine that there's going to be healings because we don't have as human beings that kind of power. It's not up to us. You can't call a saving. That's why, you know, we, that's why I don't have revivals. He said, we're going to have revival. How are you going to call for a revival? You can't make anybody get revived. You can't bring about salvation. Only God can do that. Now, we can have some special meetings, but, you know, but, but just because we get together and call it revival doesn't mean revival takes place. See, only as God brings about salvations and as God brings about recommitments can revival. Revival means those who have already come to life are now being energized and brought back to life. Only God can do that. So when we look at Joel chapter 1 and verse 13, and we just read some of 14, and notice it says, call a sacred assembly, gather the elders, we can do that, and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord, your God, and cry out to the Lord. See, we can gather and uh, we can bring people to the house of the Lord and we can get people to cry you can get people to cry out, but you can't get anybody to cry out to the Lord. Now, because the second chapter is going to tell us, God says, don't tear up your garments, tear up your heart. So any, and any of us who've been around uh, for a while, you know you can't get friends, relatives, family members to come to Jesus. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And so we can cry out and we can say we're crying out to the Lord, but only in the spirit of the Lord, he is the spirit of, of supplication, he's the spirit of prayer. Only when he is active in our lives can we cry out to the Lord, because otherwise we can't even do that. We can say prayers. But can you cry out to the Lord, not without the Holy Spirit? And so we, we, we desperately need the Spirit of the living God. Now, now notice what happens. And here God shows us some things in Joel chapter 1 when they're called to call a, a solemn or a sacred assembly. What God has done before that in chapter 1. Now you need to read this, Joel chapter 1. He's bringing about the worst locust plague in Judah's history. The worst locust plague in the history of Judah is going to happen. Well, guess what? We had 9-11. And for two or three weeks, the churches were filled. All that went by the wayside. Because, you know, uh, God knows how to get our attention and when certain things happen, then we're willing to look at the Lord for a minute. Now, we're not going to change our lives. We're not going to draw close to him. Jesus said, a people, Isaiah talked about his right. They're far from me with their heart. Now, they talk a good talk from the lips, amen. But their heart is far from me. So what God does, uh, if we look at chapter 1, then he calls upon a number of, of people to take a look at their, uh, at their situation. 
So in this locust plague that happened years ago in the nation of Israel, there was uh, in chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, and 6 to 7, um, and verse 15, I'm not going to read this, but the crops were consumed by the locust attack. See, you mess with folks' food. <laughs> yeah, you know that. Old Mother Hubbard went to the to get her poor dog. <laughs> See, <laughs> a bone. But when she got there, the cupboard was bare. Amen. See, so you, you know uh, when God starts messing with our food and our money. People are willing to listen. So even before God called the preachers, he said, I'm going to the supermarket. You go to the supermarket and can't find anything. And, and you got nothing at home. You call your neighbor. And so he says, there's the cutting locust. There's the swarming locust. There's the hopping locust. <laughs> Uh, it's like it's a hopping locust, okay? I, I got the cutting locust. You got the swarming locust. You got the, see, you go to the hip hop. You got the hopping locust. They're hopping. You got the stripping locust. The st a stripping locust take everything off the trees and every, leaves everything. And as a result of, the, of, the, uh, of, of this, hungry cries of anguish are going to be heard everywhere. Not just old Mother Hubbard going to the cupboard to get a poor dog a bone. There's no food anywhere. So one of the things we know that uh, God, uh, God uses to get our attention is uh, when he allows poverty. And, 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 and God called it this way. One prophet said, I'm going to give you cleanness of teeth. In other words, you don't even have to brush your teeth because you ain't got no food to put in them. You ain't got to worry about toothpicks and digging it, flossing, because you, you ain't eating nothing. Cleanness of, of teeth. They ain't got to worry about it. <laughs> so God gets our attention. See, long as things are going good, we don't pay any attention. So what God is trying to do is, is help the preachers out because he makes it so tough that people are looking at this situation and now they're crying out to God. And so what he says to the priest is he says, but still people aren't coming because it's so bad that you, you need to have animal sacrifices, but there's not going to be any animals to sacrifice. So now what are you going to do? And it gets so bad that in verse 19 and verse 20, the Bible says, God says, get your animals and, and tell them to pray. <laughs> you say, no, God wouldn't do that. Well, look at verse 19 and 20. 19 and 20. He says, O Lord, to you I cry out, for fire has devoured the open pastures, and a flame has burned all the trees of the field. Verse 20. The beasts of the field also cry out to you. So what, what Joel is saying, the animals are crying out. You see, he's trying to make a plea. You know, it's, it's so bad the animals aren't eating, and so they're starving, so they're crying out. It's a bad situation. It's a bad situation. So what, what Joel does, in this, again, in this first chapter, is so he starts to talk to different people, and he talks to the older people, then he talks to drunkards, he talks to worshipers, and he talks to farmers. Joel chapter 1. He talks to older people, and you, and you find out. What he says to the older people is this. He said, you ever seen it this bad? He says, remember, now you, you old now. You ever seen it like this before? He said, and then if that's not good enough, you, how about your parents when they were old? <laughs> they ever seen it this bad before? Have you heard of it being this bad? See, God got their attention. The older people. You know, because, see, normally people are not going to listen to older people. But the older people were saying, I've never seen it this bad before. 
I've never seen it. Folks starting to listen. Say, how bad is it? Look, my mother never seen it that bad before. My grandmother never seen it that bad before. So now we're going into history. And people are saying, it's bad. Well, that's what folks are saying today in America. They're saying, it's been bad before, but guess what? Not this bad. You got earthquakes, you got fires, you got tornadoes, you got hurricanes, you got murders, you got all kinds of stuff going on, one after another. It's been bad, but I don't remember it being this bad before. And in the midst of that, God is going to say through Joel, call a solemn assembly. The difference is that God is saying, you need to make sure your heart is right. Joel chapter 2, Joel chapter 2. But so what we want to do is call religious services. And so, you know, you, we can call all kind of folks to do stuff. Is that really going to make it? Is that really going to work? Because is that going to make my heart right? Now, I talked with some people and I said, I, you know, I said, I, I would be there. And they got, we got a meeting tomorrow. And then people want to start a fast, but... Uh, because of my physical situation, I won't be able to do that because I got to eat. No, no, you know, when you get, you know, it's, it's diabetic. It's, di- it's uh, you, things you got to do. Things you got to do. So, but I'll go to a meeting. But the point I said to the leaders is that we can have a meeting, but can we call a solemn assembly? Our, is our hearts, are our, our, our hearts going to change? Listen, you know, the priest got it impacted because nobody's coming to church. <laughs> so let's call a fast and get the people to come back to church. For what? So we can point them to Jesus or I can have a large crowd. See, and so what happens is that they had nothing to do. And if, you're, if all you're doing for the Lord is external, that's why a lot of folks can't retire. You say, well, okay, you, you know, now you retired, and uh, uh, so now you can't do what you, you know, you can't get around here and there. But if your heart is right, you can still pray for folks. Amen. Amen. That's why the Bible says that older people can be just as impactful, if not more impactful, in their old age because now they've given themselves up to prayer, ministry of the word, praying for one another over and over and over. That's what's most important. Amen. Because you can come see Pastor Julius, but if you haven't seen Savior Jesus, if you ain't seen the good shepherd, only seen the under shepherd, the under shepherd can't help you. All, all the, all, all the under shepherd can do is point you to the over shepherd. You got a problem. Let me point you to Jesus. I can help you with that, but I can't solve your problem. I can't solve your problem. So he calls the elders and he asks them, you ever see anything? He calls the drunkards. This is in verse five to seven. So if you read Joel chapter one, he calls the junkards, drunkards rather, excuse me, drunkards, people who live in pleasure and live for pleasure. And they are intoxicated by the sensual and the soulical elements of life. See, drunkards, what the Bible is saying is that you give them a man or a woman, uh, you give them some good times, and what men and women are going to do? They're going to drink. They're going to get intoxicated. Now, this is all through the Old Testament. They also will use drugs. And because people will alter their minds in order to get high. I mean, we've been singing about this for years. Don't take you higher. Um, kakalakalaka, um, kakalaka, da, da, da. Take you higher. Ah! You know we love that. Hey, hey, you know, I mean, come on. We could be sitting down at a table like we in a coma. The music starts to play. Amen. Higher, 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 higher. We brought that into the church. <laughs> higher, higher, higher. 
That's all right, but, but my point is, see, God is talking to people who love pleasure. And before you and I got saved, that's how we lived. We lived in pleasure. And so your drug might have been one thing, your alcohol, whatever, but we lived and we had a good time. As a matter of fact, matter of fact you know, uh, when we got saved and we moved out of the world, people would say, you having a what without alcohol? How are you going to have a party without alcohol? So God is talking to the drunkards. See, the, the drunkards aren't going to pay any attention until you take away their drink. There ain't no alcohol. Uh, imagine how people would, what people would do if God, for a weekend, come Friday at 4 o'clock, took away all the alcohol, the drugs, and people couldn't shoot up, hook up, couldn't do any of this stuff until, until Monday morning. Folks would be jumping off buildings. Say preachers too? <laughs> Bridges too. <laughs> if you live, see, the Bible says that uh, it's talking about drunkards, and Isaiah talked about it, Jeremiah talked about it, all the prophets talked about it, Jesus talked about it. Because we love to get ourselves in a situation where we can do what we do. The thing about alcohol is that, or a drug, is that it loosens our inhibitions. And we don't mind being what we really want to be. Amen. That's my temptations. Cloud nine. You can be what you want to be. Every man in his mind is free. Amen. That's what the Beatles were about in Hey Jude. Hey Jude, you're going to make it better. Just get it under your skin. And then it began to make it better. Yeah. So God is calling to the drunkards. See, people say God tries to get our attention. God knows how to get our attention. Amen. You take food off some people's table. You take drink out of some folks. Hey, uh, you know, they, they, hey the big thing years ago, when, when, when soon as we got an opportunity to get a nice uh, house, what do we do? Downstairs, we put in a... There you go. <laughs> so he's talking to the truckers. He says, I'm going to get your attention. What you going to do? I'm going to take away your drink. Now folks are willing to listen. And then he talks to the worshipers who have no sacrifice to bring. And they have no sacrifice. And he says, so what you going to do? And if your worship is external, then, and that's what people do. People say, well, I'm going to this church. Why? Because, man, they got this band. They got this orchestra. They got drums. They got guitars. They got uh, saxophones. They got this. They got that. And so God said, well, what if I take away that? And all I want you to do is a joyful noise. Folks wouldn't go. He calls on the word. He said, if I just leave you with nothing but Jesus, what you going to do? People walk out. Jesus, Jesus, they want more than Jesus. So he talks to the, then he talks to the farmers, to the farmers in verse 11 and 12. Verse 11, Joel 1 and 11 says, be ashamed, you farmers. Well, you vine dressers for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. Amen. You know, the, a hard-working farmer. This is, this is an agricultural society. You work. All, you work hard. You plant. You water. All this, you weed. Everything you do, and there's no harvest. There's no harvest. And the, the farmers, see, again, God doesn't try to get our attention. God knows how to get our attention. You work hard all year long, and come harvest time, there's nothing. Amen. And then he talks to the priests. So my point is that we can call meetings, but can we call a sacred assembly? You know what we'd have to do? First of all, before we could call a sacred assembly, whatever situation we find ourselves in, we'd have to start with prayer. 
Father, I come before you right now in Jesus' name. And I understand that I'm messed up. And that if you hadn't put me in this position, I wouldn't even be calling upon you now. Because long as things go, are going good, I go, you know, uh, I go about my merry way. I do what I want to do. But when things get bad and I got no other help, then I might say, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know. And if thou would withdraw thyself from me, whether shall I go? Whether. The idea of whether means where, wherever, wherever can I go? It's one of those uh, contractions that we in the culture would say. You remember when James Brown said, what's on ever? <laughs> what's on ever? I said, what are you talking about, James? What's on ever? He meant whatsoever. That's what we, so we said, weather. We said, what do you mean weather? No, we're not talking about the weather. We're talking about wherever. Can we go? Call a solemn assembly. So we got to start out with prayer and start out confession and admitting, Lord, you know. And so that's what I'm I'm, I'm going tomorrow uh, to Elizabeth Baptist. I'm going to go. I'm going to pray with the brothers. And uh, my thing is to say, but I've been with these brothers and prayed with these brothers before. And the Lord said, but you don't know, I might be doing something this time. Amen. I might be doing something. You, you can't close up the door because you don't know what God is going to do. You don't know what he is going to do. And so the Bible will tell us in Joel chapter 1 and chapter 2, it says, don't give up because there's a great possibility because of who our God is. Even though we have messed up, God still might hear us. That's the great hope we have. That's the great hope. That's the difference between God and us. Is that what God says, and we'll get, to, uh, we'll get to that. He says, don't give up because God is gracious. He's merciful. He's long-suffering. This is his character. And people have messed up before and done worse things than this. And God might relent. He might, in this situation, change his mind Although he hasn't changed his mind from the point that he says, if you, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. So God doesn't change his mind, but God has put this provision already in effect. So my brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter how messed up you and I have been. It doesn't matter what we have done wrong. It doesn't matter how many times we have messed up. It doesn't matter what the situation is. Our God is long-suffering. He's merciful. His mercy endures forever. You can come to him. You can call upon his name. Joel says, who knows if God will deliver and save you. You So we thank God because we deal with people who are going through all kinds of stuff and they say, I don't qualify. Are you breathing? You qualify for mercy. Hallelujah. His mercy. His mercy endures to all generations. God is good. How do you know he's good? Because he's been that good to me. Amen. Because if God's mercy had a, had a place where it stopped, I would be lost. But thank God. So Joel says, see, our hope is always in God. God. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we, we keep praying for our loved ones because God, no matter how messed up the situation is, God. See, no matter how scrambled, you know, that old, that old, uh, that old nursery rhyme uh, uh, with uh, about the egg, you know, Humpty Dumpty. You know, remember he sat on the wall, had a, had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men. But God, God delights in taking scrambled lives, scrambled eggs, and unscrambling them. 
And that's how you know it was God, because can't nobody else unscramble scrambled eggs. Once they scramble, they straight scram- they scramble. Only God can take your scrambled eggs and make them over easy. <laughs> Sunny side up. Ain't he good? He's an awesome God. He's an awesome God. So we call a solemn assembly. So I plan to go tomorrow and say, Lord, let, help me get my heart right. Because if I'm looking at anybody else's heart, I remember uh, reading a book about, a little small book about how you know you need revival. Nancy Lee DeMoss, who's now Nancy, who's now Nancy uh, DeMoss Wagamuth. Yeah. She said, you know, you know you need revival when you think you don't. Hey, Amen. She was, she was hitting about no revival. I'm reading this. I said, yeah, girl, that girl is right on. Right. Amen. 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 She said, you know you need revival when you don't think you do. And I said, hold up. Let me stop here. Let me stop here and examine myself. That girl is right. Father, you get to the point where you, you know, you, see, the prayer is, it's me. It's me. It's me, oh Lord. When you get to the pl- part where, uh, to the place where you're saying, it's them. It's them. It's her. It's him. They're standing in need of prayer. That's when you know you need prayer. The songwriter said, not my brother, not my mother. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. So, to say, Father, we can meet, but we can't call a solemn assembly without your spirit, without you convicting us that, as Amos says, we can get at ease in Zion. You know, well, we're living pretty good. Things are going pretty good. And we just, the status quo. And by the way, we're, you know, as we study on Wednesday, we were looking at our relationship with Jesus Christ. And there's a, we encourage you uh, that, that we still got a few books available. If you haven't come, there's only, there's only one time uh, that you've missed. You, you ought to get there. And the one thing in a relationship we talked about is plateau. Plateau, amen. Level off. You know, see, we might say it this way. We, we sing it, I'm climbing up the rough side of the mountain. Say, so, well, I was climbing, but now I've reached a plateau where it's just nice and easy. I haven't reached the top, but I reached a plateau where I feel pretty comfortable. See, and the problem with that is, as the members were saying, once you plateau, the next thing you know, you're going to be backsliding. You got to keep pressing toward the mark. So, can we call a solemn assembly? If we go to God first and ask the Holy Spirit to deal with our own lives, and if we do that, we can call a solemn assembly. It's because the Lord is working in and through us. We can't do it on our own. You know, as we look at all this stuff, and God is, is getting people, what He is doing is He's causing people to look to Him. And what God led me to do is I, I looked at this. I got a, I say I got the email. I read this stuff, and I started working on this last Sunday. And one of the things I, I, I hear all the time, you know, people are more afraid of human beings than they are of God. So God got the people in Joel's day to the point where they were more concerned about him than somebody else. And I listen to, uh, you know, more people are afraid or people are more afraid of Korean leader Kim and President Trump than they are of God. So what they, what they going to do? Man, they, they crazy. Man, it might be World War III. Man, you better take your eyes off Kim and take your eyes off Trump and put your eyes on God. Amen. You know what? You know what? Uh, some are concerned about ISIS. Some are concerned about what happened in Las Vegas. Others are concerned about Mother Nature. People are concerned about robberies, drugs, but people aren't considered or concerned about God. And Jesus said this, And do not fear those, Matthew 10, 28, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able 
to destroy both soul and body in Hades. Amen. In hell. Jesus said, that's who you ought to, ought to fear. And when I look, at, I look at that, I'm going, that's exactly right. I'm not worried about Kim or Trump or whatever leader. It's about my relationship with the true and living God. Because as Isaiah says, you think you're healthy? Get your next breath if God says no. Amen. Amen. Get your next breath. You can't do it without God. And so you begin to understand, I need to fear God. Let me drop down to a, a, another scripture, Isaiah twenty nine thirteen. Isaiah twenty nine thirteen. Thank you, my sister got it already. Notice what it says. Uh, Isaiah twenty nine thirteen. Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their heart hearts from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandments of men. Now here's what he meant. You got to go to Matthew. You go to Matthew and read the 15th chapter, and Jesus quotes what Isaiah had said. And what Jesus gave the example, he says, the Bible says, honor your father and your mother. But here's what you Pharisees teach. I got some extra money, and I'm going to devote it to the church. And therefore, when I devote it to the church, I don't have money to take care of my mother or father, but I'm not guilty of breaking that commandment because I'm going to give it to the church. See, what Jesus said, you're teaching as commandments the traditions of men. And, and so you see what happens? So we, be, we, if we're not careful, and Jesus said, so my fear is taught by rules and regulations and external situations, but not the heart. Amen. And so we have situations. You, you remember it used to be people get upset uh, if you didn't come to church with a three-piece suit? Now, God was never upset with that. But people would say, you know, you need, to, you need to dress better than that coming to church. That was a tradition. Whereas God was saying, if you come to Jesus, I will clothe you with the righteousness of Christ. But we were more concerned about a three-piece suit or women wearing dresses than we were about the righteousness of Christ. You see what I'm saying? And, and so Jesus said, that is what's going on. So people fear, so that they get ready to go to church and they fear, man, I got you know, to have a white, white shirt, a tie, a three-piece suit. I got to have this to, call, you know, to make sure I come in and worship right. God never gave that commandment. He said, come to Jesus and I'll give you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So we felt it was more important for the tradition than what the Bible was actually saying. And so Jesus said, people's fear is taught by tradition of men. And so people f were fearing the wrong things. Hey Amen. I remember, uh, you know, going back 40 years or so, I remember one time I, uh, it was so hot, nobody had air conditioning, I was sweating, and I, and I, and I, and I took off my suit jacket. And I felt so uncomfortable. I said, everybody looking at me. And they think I'm sinning. And I'm sweat pouring down. You see what I'm saying? The fear of man or the fear of God is taught by God don't want you. And one day God told me, he said, to me, he said how was church? You know, you know, see, God talks to us personal. Yeah, and one day God said to me, how was church? And as I began to respond, the Lord said, you know you didn't hear anything. All you did was wipe sweat. <laughs> said, you ain't heard nothing. And if you think I'm more satisfied with watching you wipe sweat, and you come out saying, ah, I just served the Lord. Ah, man, I'll sweat it out for Jesus. And, 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 and the Lord said, you ain't heard a word that was said. 
and you couldn't wait to get out. Rather than enjoying and worshiping. Jesus said, see, his fear is taught by tradition rather than the word of the living God. So that's another thing Joel was dealing with. He was dealing with people who were used to the external. See, my brothers and sisters, if you don't have a personal relationship uh, with Jesus, then your life is empty. You need to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing else you do will satisfy. Nothing else will make it. The other day I was at a situation where I was at breakfast and a gentleman I've known for a long time wanted to talk to me about some things in the Bible and he wanted to go beyond what the Bible said and go to something else and uh, I, I listened, I listened, I listened, I told him I, I got to go and uh, he asked me what do I think, I said the problem is you know you, you complicated the whole matter, you go on to something and, and uh, you've got a degree and you've written a couple of books and all this kind of stuff when God's word is so simple. Man's problem is not what you're saying it is. Man's problem is that he sinned and rebelled against God. Jesus came into this world to save sinners. The gospel is about, as the message is about man has sinned. And what God has done through Jesus Christ has provided salvation. It's real simple. He said, well, I'm saying the same thing you're saying. I said, no, you added on. You, you done made it a Jesus that I couldn't recognize. Because any time you're talking about psychology or uh, philosophy or all those other, you know, uh, things that people talk about, the book of Colossians is all about that. Don't let anybody spoil you going to those kind of things. I said, here's one thing I know. That without Jesus, I was a sinner and I was lost on my way to hell. But, I, but when I prayed and asked Jesus to come into my life and I was sincere and I trusted him, he gives me the Holy Spirit. My eyes are open. I can hear from God. I can talk with God. I respond to God. I went from spiritual death to spiritual life. And it's real simple, just believing the gospel message. That's how you get delivered. Nothing else can deliver you. So I've had people want to argue, but, they say, but you're still a slave. I'm no slave. The Bible says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I'm not enslaved to sin. I'm not enslaved to bond. I'm not in bondage to sin. I'm not in bondage to self. I'm not in bondage. And the one thing that you didn't deal with was the devil. I'm not in bondage to him because of Jesus Christ. And so victory is mine. Victory is yours. You know, Jesus is the one who gives us the victory. So what God was doing, first of all, he got their attention so they would listen to the message. And the message was that God was going to judge them. But the other part of the message is God is merciful. And it may be, it may be that God will relent. And my brothers and sisters, we point you to Jesus. We, as, as was said before, you know, listen, Jesus has come that we might have life and have it more abundantly. You know, there are many of us can point back on our lives and say, you know what, there was a time when we thought it was over. You know, what are we going to do? It's done. But, you know, uh, we, we, we know, we know of a man named Hezekiah. Prophet went to Hezekiah and told him, he said, your life is done. It's done. God is, your life is required. Get your house in order. Ain't nothing else can be done. Because you're leaving here. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall. Called upon the name of his Lord. And what happened? Brother, got 15 more years. 15 more years. My point is, none of us know what's going on. We get bad messages from other folks. They, people can tell you stuff, but we can always turn our face to the Lord. Because who knows how gracious he is going to be. 
And if you have never come to Jesus, I'm telling you, taste of the Lord and see that he is gracious. He has the final say in everything. When he got Hezekiah's attention, all he wanted Hezekiah to do was pray and call upon his name. And Hezekiah got 15 more. You don't know what your time is up. You don't know what's going on. But you know you got a God who is gracious, merciful. He's that kind of God. He changes situations. He can take what you think is impossible. As Jeremiah says, there's nothing that's impossible for the Lord. Why do you say that, Jeremiah? Because he created the heavens and the earth. My God. My God. See, the brother brother was telling me that he said, our problem is that we were created in the image of God, and God is a producer, and we're not producing, we're consumers. So people need to understand that they're not consumers, but they're producers. I said, brother, you just, look here, man. (laughs) Look here. The problem is, when you say God is a producer, God is a creator. I can produce, but nobody can take nothing. See, that's what creation is, out of nothing. Next week when we look at this thing, the first thing we talk, we talk about in God is creation. <laughs> creation. Fall. Flood. The nations. 4,000 years ago, God said through Abraham, I'm going to provide a way to save everybody. And so I told her, brother, I'm just a nobody. Talking about somebody. Amen. Who can save anybody? And what you're saying doesn't work at all. But what, what I'm talking about, I've seen work for 40 years. Because it's all about Jesus and the gospel message. My brothers and sisters, we're going to stop here. But that's, that's where we are. And we commend you that, listen, it, it's, it's bad out there and it's getting worse. And God is getting people's attention. The only difference I, that I say among other folks say, well, he's trying. No, God ain't got to try nothing. <laughs> God, I'm try- no, no, God ain't trying nothing. I got to try. God ain't got to try. Yeah, as I close, I, I told you uh, uh, the story when God told me when I was cutting the grass. He said, uh, I'm going to call you to, go, to leave uh, Pilgrim and go to Friendship. And uh, I said, well, you know, I've been talking to my wife. I, I've been, well, I'll go in and talk with her. But you got you to convince her. And the Lord said, well, go in and talk with her. I said, well, I've been trying. God said, go talk to her. I went in and said a couple words. She said, wherever God says I'll go, I'm going. I said to me, I went back out. I said, God, how do you do that? Because I don't try nothing. I accomplish. I send my word out. I do exactly what I want. I ain't got to try something. You got to try it. I don't try nothing. I speak and worlds come into being. What do you mean I'm trying something? I don't try anything. Amen. I can do it. Amen. He's the original Nike album, Nike, Nike uh, uh, slogan. Just do it. <laughs> Say, well, are you trying? No, I ain't trying nothing. I just do it. That's who our God is. That's who our God is. My brothers and sisters, we ought to listen to him. Because God is getting people's attention. Will you stand with me? And as many as want to be as led want to come and pray together.